Welcome to the video. Today I'm playing a lower rated opponent and I'll show you their mistakes so that you don't have to make them in the future. Let's go d4 in this position. Playing Rai Guy 841 from Bulgaria. With a rating of 852 it appears. Alright, it goes e5 in this position known as the England Gambit. Now, this move is not the best objectively, it offers a pawn and the uh, compensation is some development if played correctly. However, bishop c5 is not the main line. My assumption is that logical play with knight f3 right. First, we want to develop our knights and bishops and then we can castle later on, should lead to an advantage. I think I know where this guy is going. It appears as if he's been watching... Uh, Eric Rosen, I think. And after pawn takes d6, he's gonna go knight e7. I can guarantee it. There we go, he goes knight e7. It's very funny actually. This is a very famous trick by Eric Rosen. The idea is that if you take on e7, you're winning a piece and white is winning. Nah, the reality is a bit different. Bishop takes f2, king takes f2, and the queen on d1 is left and pre and grabbed mercilessly by the black pieces. However, there's no need to allow such things, just g3, bishop g2 castles, and I'm up a clean pawn. And there is no compensation here by black whatsoever. So not falling for this little trick with knight e7. He goes b6, uh, opening up the diagonal h1, a8 prematurely in my opinion. And a move like knight d4 should seize the initiative. Forcing him to play c6 when he's not going to be able to go bishop b7 and fianchetto with bishop. So knight d4 appears to be a good move in this position. By the way, if you're enjoying the commentary to the games, I do something very similar on my Twitch channel. When I uh, play games there with viewers or with players in the pool, I try and make an instructive commentary there as well. Alright, c6, the only way not to lose the rook on a8 or a knight on c6. Just castling, trying to complete development is more than enough in this position. Bishop g5 looks strong, and then suddenly bishop takes e7 might be a slightly unpleasant threat. And here my idea was that f6 by my opponent might be a slight weakness actually. There is a golden rule not to move your f-pawn ever. There are some exceptions to this rule, but I think the weakness of the a2 g8 diagonal might be a factor here. Now, where do I put my bishop? I noticed that if I put it on e3, I am blocking for my central pawn, which is not ideal, but perhaps it's a compromise I'm willing to make. The alternative would be to put it on d2, which looks even worse, or on f4, which doesn't look too great either. Letting him take on f4 and weakening my pawn structure slightly. So bishop e3 appears to be the best option in my eyes. And then I'll continue later with knight c3 to e4. And suddenly I've gotten all my minor pieces into the game with a pretty pleasant position I think. Alright, so knight c3 or not, I think knight c3 is a very good move. Though there is something better, there's a golden rule. Find a good move, look for better, popularized by the chess press. What's the better move for white in this position? Feel free to pause the video for 3 seconds or so. Yeah, it's You don't need to be a rocket scientist. Knight e6, it's a fork on the queen and on the rook. Generally, allowing your opponent to fork your queen and rook with the knight isn't favorable. You're gonna have to move the queen. And then you lose the rook for the knight. So like 2 points of material, the rook is worth 5 pawns and the knight 3, on average that it is. And then you're losing 2 pawns on this exchange. So bishop b7, while tempting, trying to develop your pieces, complete development. White, uh, black should have paid attention to the threat of knight e6 here. And now my opponent is already lost. Just gonna take on f8 next. And then I'm gonna have a lead in development pawn more and an exchange more as well so my opponent is in very deep trouble it appears. I'm curious, I think queen d7 is the only squares that protects the bishop on d6. Uh, queen c8 leaves the bishop on d6 and pre so that guy can just be taken. The question is do I start by taking on f8 
If I start by taking on f8, my opponent might be a genius and goes bishop c7, claiming that my knight is trapped. Now, I'm not sure if my opponent's gonna see it. Not uh, sometimes you take the gamble. But I think taking on d6 is fine as well. My argument is that rook e8 is anyways met with knight c7, which is gonna be a fork on both the rooks. And then I thought something along the lines of rook d8 might be a try attacking the queen. And after the queen moves, trying to somehow uh, save the rook on a8. I think I take on e7, rook d7, a knight, uh, a queen e8 should win there. Though in this position, I don't need to make it complicated at all. The conversion is pretty simple, so overcomplications aren't necessary. Oh, I have queen e6, by the way, after rook d7 in the end of the line. So it doesn't even work out too well for my opponent. So knight c7, does he have some knight f5 shenanigans? That's the question. I don't think he does. I think uh, both the rooks are still under attack. And if g5, attacking the queen, then queen c4, g5 is a big weakness. And if I ju can just sidestep with a check, then my opponent's not going to have time to capture the knight on c7. So knight c7 appears to win even more material in this position. And white has already built up a decisive advantage in this position, it appears. Let's see what our opponent's going to do. He has to be incredibly creative here. Alright, uh, the knight on e7 looks quite free. And rook d7, I have this important check on e6, which my opponent perhaps overlooked is uh, what I'd suggest. Yeah, I think his mistake um, is a very common one. That once you blunder for the first time, the blunders keep on rolling. It could have something to do with psychology. That when you've already blundered, you've already given up. You don't try to fight as hard as you perhaps should. Now, in this position, if my opponent goes queen d7, He's keeping the bishop on d6 protected and will minimize the damage. He's going to lose an exchange. I'll take on f8 in this position and I'm up an exchange and a pawn and I'm much better. But he's not going to lose as much material as in the game and then he would have more realistic chances of continuing the fight. Let's go queen e6 check in this position and then gobble up yet another exchange on a8. And uh, my material advantage is far beyond decisive at this stage in the game. I have to be honest, my opponent's first serious mistake was knight e7. Yes, it's a cute trick that if I take on e7, okay, king f8 he plays, uh, I think I'm gonna take on a8. Let's do it. I was uh, hoping to get some bishop c5 check to work, but it didn't. b6 is covering the square, or else it could be checkmate nearly. Bishop takes a8. Alright, the only move I should refrain from playing is rook d1 in this position, thinking that I've pinned his rook. Well, I have to be so cautious. Okay, I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna right click. Oh, thank goodness. Sometimes, you know, I left click and make the move by accident. And if then the rook later takes on d1, the queen on c8 is pinned. Isn't that great? It would be. Um, not uh, exactly, however as uh, it's gonna be with check rook takes d1 so instead completing development with knight c3 is simple and effective now back to what i was saying knight e7 by my opponent is a mistake it's what we call hope chess right that you hope your opponent will make a mistake he was hoping i'd take on e7 and then he could take on f2 king takes f2 and take on d1 and then he's won my queen the problem is your opponents aren't always gonna fall for your tricks and after I simply develop my pieces my opponent is down a pawn right I mean he'd have to move his bishop twice in this position or take on d6 with the pawn when he gets an isolated pawn in the center which is the alternative and then he's not going to have at all sufficient compensation for the missing pawn right so this was a big mistake 97 something you should avoid in the future uh, if the opponent is watching by any chance to play hope chess Anyhow, back to the game, knight c3, I am up a rook, and the bishop, and the pawn, I believe. My opponent's pieces on b8 and a8 and c8 look quite passive as well, so that's also not going to be a helpful factor for him. Not the most important factor, but still, uh, generally, when you're up material, you want to trade off as many pieces as possible, 
Why is this? Well, for starters, it's gonna make the conversion simpler. There are fewer pieces, fewer ways to blunder, and the win will be easier. But what is a more scientific slash mathematical explanation? Yeah, I'm always happy to trade off pieces, by the way. It's that the ratio you're ahead of in material increases. So how does that work? Let's go to the starting position. And let's say that here we remove the black queen. Okay, white is going to be up 9 points in this position. However, each side is going to have some... Uh, is offering a draw. Okay, back to my point. That there's going to be a lot of material, so 9 points, while still a lot, ratio-wise isn't going to be as much as if, let's say, there are no pieces on the board, just king and king, and one of the sides has a queen, right? Then the ratio of points is going to be 9 to 0, while here it's going to be something like, I don't know, 40 to 30, uh, to 31, something like this. Actually, it's a bit funny. My opponent, he offered a draw, so he blocked the notation. So I couldn't press back to where I was in the game. I had to manually go back. Anyhow, uh, rook d8 is simply a skier on both the knight and the bishop. And my opponent's gonna lose even more material in this position. So at this stage of the game, regardless of what it does, the doom is the faith of destiny. If you enjoyed this video, and you want to support the channel, help our goal to get to 1000 subscribers. Maybe you want to see me play against other players of uh, roughly his caliber and explain what mistakes they are making so you don't make them in the future. Feel free to subscribe, like and share the video.